welcome to another video and <laughs> this video it will be about the critique of real socialism and some modern approaches such as cyber socialism we argue there's still a capitalist system that builds on compulsion to work on class and patriarchy with a still a domination of exchange value and money produces company against policies the conviction between state and company and inefficiency that's fundamentally of economic not a political problem that can't be solved by bringing new leaders or democratization and then we'll argue that we need a communist society where it's about to each according to her need and a voluntariness instead of according to her work and compulsion with this concept a lot of things we are agree on for example they also are very critical of our, like this reformist idea that a social ecological market economy will, will be possible but on other things we disagree um, the critique of real socialism, of course, uh, in the 20th century, there was a lot of critique of it, and maybe it come some of the elements will are part of this. There's on the one hand, it's considered authoritarian. There's still injustice and class with the elites, the bureaucratic elites getting more than other people. Although there's a much more equilibrium between the workers, some workers still get more than others. Um, there's still the question of class, that these bureaucratic people um, that kind of own the means of production, or like state bureaucratic apparatus, um, or are they no, no class at all? Um, there's still alienation and wage labor and personal unfreedom. Um, there's still the patriarchy and privatized care labor sector, although there are also some improvements made, but basically still most of the care labor is unpaid for and um, in large parts also female. Um, and there is also this domination of exchange value, where we still have a lack of planning and of democracy. A little bit of Marxology at the beginning because there are Marxist states that came up there, Marxist systems. Um, Marx had a pretty dull critique of this lower stage of communism, how he called it, where there's still this compulsion to work. Um, he said that this equal right that everybody gets the same amount and has to work the same amount is unfair for unequal people. And of course, um, modern um, arguments for this would say yeah of course but you can give people who have like children or who have special disabilities or whatever you can they can have more than others and so um you could give like to unequal individuals um different opportunities or for example the holland communists um they say that each hour is one one hour it has the same worth um, and some people may, could do a lot in one hour and some people could do a lot less in one hour, but still one hour is one hour. Because Marx didn't think that much about utopian alternative at all. There are like very few things where there are some tiny parts where he talks about it. And they're usually not, they're good, but they're not that good at other stuff that he wrote. And with Marx, you could argue a lot better that with these, they're still this opposition, this contradiction between concrete and abstract labor, um, producing this contradiction between use and its exchange value, which he called once the focal point around which the understanding of political economy revolves. Now, into real socialism as wage socialism, so it's still wage-based, and it's structure and incentive problem. It's important to, to consider that like different alternatives to capitalism have a different idea what capitalism is. There are, I think, three elements to capitalism that come up pretty often. First, the means of production of private. Second, that the market dominates the reproduction, that basically market structures say what is produced and how to distribute it. And three, that there is still um, there's a compulsion to work there. And this means that the care labor is separated because it's uh, not paid for and then um, in Pedro patriarchal logic attributed to women and then this compulsion to work also leads to um, the exchange value ruling over the use value and with um, focusing on diff different elements of this capitalism different um, alternatives will come up for example the eco-social market economy they um, focus on a domination of the market and they say we still need the market but it shouldn't be that dominating anymore and we need more state um, and you know, I don't have it but market socialists would say we also need a very strongly regulated market economy but we have to get um, rid of element one the means of production should 
be shouldn't be private but the workers should have their means of production of their factory <clears throat> in the command economy the they want to get rid of the means of production as private because they want to have them as a state property and they want to get rid of markets in general and the persuasion so society they want to get rid of all three elements so if the means of production as private means the market the domination of the market and the compulsion to work so with um, real socialism or wage socialism Karkshan and Cottrell made it pretty clear that was, there was to be no source of income other than labor and all labor was to be traded as equal um, from the Soviet constitution the 12th article in the USSR, work is a duty and a matter of honor for every able-bodied citizen. In accordance with the principle, he who does not work, neither shall he eat. The principle applied in the USSR is that of socialism, from each according to his ability to each according to his work. And the communist um, principle would be from each according to his ability to each according to um, his need. He doesn't work, he sh neither shall he eat. This was directly more to the capitalists and not to people who cannot work, but still it could also use to create, and it was used then um, to criticize people who don't, who cannot work or who don't want to work um, in <laughs> what seemed to be good work for them by the state, <laughs> the party. Um, so here it's a gun that between the market economy and the democratic command socialism, you have this range where Green New Deal, eco-social market economy, market socialism, a capitalist command economy where still there's the means of production of private, which is bound together by this common thing of wage, labor, money and commodity production. And what our general argument will be is that market economy and command planning, they share a capitalist base. They share this capitalist base of wage labor in domination of exchange value and therefore the command planning can't really be considered as alternative to capitalism but it's just a different form of capitalism. And we ask for this commonest base of voluntariness and motivation by use value where you have a decentral or central, fully central coordination come out of it. So now some um, quotes. Lenin first said Labor productivity is in the last instant the most important and decisive factor for the victory of the new social order. But, in read socialism, economic performance, net income and labor productivity were only 33%, like a third. And that's like um, Eastern Germany, and Eastern Germany is probably the most efficient <laughs> Uh, like real socialist society that was out there um, and they still only read a, a third of what the western part uh, reached. Um, Erich Hanke, he's like a professor um, and he is a Marxist and a real socialist and he wrote in many sectors of our economy there's no real incentive to work. Um, and Schürer, he was like the, the head of the planning commission in the Democratic Republic of Germany for 25 years <laughs> until the end and he says it has now been proven that over centralized or even total planning does not and cannot work. It is neither sensible nor controllable in terms of planning and administration not even with the best computer technology. And we'll dive a little bit deeper into the empirical findings because it's, I think it's very important to understand 20th century and what um, our, our forebears fought for and what they did to understand what should we do in the 21st century. And sometimes people just glimpse over the 20th century and what went wrong there. And I, I don't know Stalinism, I don't have nothing to do with and I'm completely different. But I think we really have to understand it so we, that we don't do the same things again. Okay, empirical findings. In the, in the literature you will find often terms like the state priorities versus company and employee agonism. So there's still this kind of um, huge contradiction between what the state wants and what the company and the employees want. The, the directors deceive the planning authorities with apparently considerable success about their actual performance in order to simplify plan fulfillment and secure bonuses. So the state said you should produce like, I don't know, 300,000 <laughs> pairs of shoes and they tried to, to bid them down or didn't show them that they could do 300,000 and so it's easy to build 230,000 all this kind of stuff. Um, so these were called the company egoist policies and they um, 
they looked for soft plans. These were plans for whose fulfillment did not require top performances from the factories. And this plan poker, this poker between the companies and the state, um, the state planning structures, was very important. Um, and it was a game of hide and seek between company and the head office. And um, a lot of times <laughs> what made somebody a good director <laughs> of, a social, of a real socialist company was if they were good at this plane poker and, and this hide and seek and had good connections to the plane commission or whatever and to, just to lower expectations so that they get more bonuses and more possibilities. Um, the empirical findings are more, there's no only overstatements compared to what is actually possible in order to obtain resources to push through projects. On the other hand, deliberate underestimate of one's own capabilities in order to secure resources to avoid risky project constraints. There was then the idea of counter plans as an answer. The party knew about these problems and then they had the idea, okay, we'll just give the companies the possibility to do counter plans. And they say, can, we can do not only 230,000 pairs of shoes, but we can 270,000. But then <laughs> these companies usually still wouldn't use their performance reserves and which would say like, yeah, 230 is really high, we can do 240, that's maximum. Um, this basic contradiction could be managed within real socialism but it remained the basis of production. Okay, now we come to the causes and the reform ideas. The causes for this was often put forward by the real socialists themselves. It's like the foreign trade and that we are in, um, with, in a market structure where we compete with other capitalist states. And it's true, but it doesn't explain all the problems that were out there. Um, there was this missing democracy and class domination. And I would say, yeah, there was the mis missing democracy and class domination, but it's still, um, even if the government was democratically elected, they still would have faced the same problems that these companies have very different interests than the state officials have, even if they were democratically uh, voted for state officials. Um, there's also this argument that they, they just did bad planning. They should use work time instead of money and computers are now out there and they use like very simple math. And it's also true, but it still doesn't account for all the problem. And I would say that the costs four and five are pretty important. There's this domination of exchange value still in, although it's kind of a non-market society, there's still exchange value, it's still a capitalist society, I would say, and there's this weak incentive structure. Okay, um, let's get into more to detail there, and it's contradiction between use and exchange value. In capitalism, individuals strive for the highest share of value. Companies strive for profit, workers for wages. And the competition now within the market society makes use value the bearer of exchange value. That was Adam Smith famously put it, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard of their own interest. Therefore, we have a fundamental contradiction within all capitalist societies between the enterprise and the individual rationality versus the societal rationality, so what's good for the society as a whole. Within wage socialism, um, you don't have that much you don't have private capitalists, you could call them state capitalists, but there's far less injustice if they then went into the villas of the um, bureaucratic class in Eastern Germany, like there, there were some um, big stuff and some I think like yeah, golden tubs or whatever, but basically it wasn't a huge thing if you look at photos now. There were some um, dictator, social, re-socialist dictators in the Ukraine or something where they really did crazy stuff with um, in exploitation of the people. Um, but all in all, there was much less injustice. But the workers are still forced to labor. Um, the enterprises strive for bonuses, resources and money or credits, and they hide the production capacities, produce lower quality and delay the products because that's just they don't have to do this, it does, like the use value is not that important as the exchange value. They go for exchange value, not for use value. The workers strive for higher wages, bonuses, and they don't 
do like really good performances. The individual goals are different from the societal goals. The money-based incentive structure to, and it's needed a money-based incentive structure to bind the investional rationalities to societal rationality. Robert Kurz, like a Marxist economist, wrote, the use value orientation appears only in the form of external state bureaucratic supervision. It's no longer in the shape of the coercive laws of competition. Therefore, it can be deceived, tricked, and perforated in a thousand different ways. And that's like what was the basic thing. They got rid of market competition, but without this market competition, the state now had to administer all the control and all the force to make sure that the companies produce real use values and they did it a lot less. Because although there's often this argument that it's a, such a authoritarian, politically it's a authoritarian system and that's true, but in economic terms it's much softer than market societies, uh, command societies. It has a very lax incentive structure. First, and that's like the basic problem, if you still have, have um, a compulsion to work, there was this difficult <laughs> decision between security and efficiency. And a lot of time real socialists say we want security and equality and not that much efficiency. For example, they didn't want an economic whip against the workers income differentiation or employment. There was very low income differentiations and virtually no unemployment. They, people didn't, couldn't just lose, if they lose, lost their job, they would get another one. But there was also no economic whip for enterprises. There was very marginal profit differentiations for the enterprises and bankruptcy was no, not possible, possible because they were all state enterprises. Therefore, the reformists, they ask for material interest for workers and enterprises. They meant higher income differentiations, performance-based pay, possibility for bankruptcy. In the end, they ask for market structures there. They wanted to um, put market structures back into place because these structures worked. They <laughs> took efficiency over security and equality. That's what the real socialists didn't want. But that's what worked in efficiency terms within a capitalist economy. This problem is also true for the other than economic aims. If you have ecological aims in an eco-command um, economy, you would have similar problems that it's difficult to push through these aims because the enterprises, again, <laughs> they, they go for the exchange value, not for the use value of ecological production. So they still may find a lot of backdoors to don't do what you want them to do. Um, one model that I like, I think it's pretty elaborate, but it still is linked to the same problem because there's still this compulsion to work central to it, is cyber socialism by Cockshell and Cottrell. What they firstly do is mathem mathematical and data optimization, so they cyber, so they use computers and say it's, they used a very bad um, algorithm for um, optimization and we can do all of this better. Um, and they use work time instead of money. That's a lot of times the argument, yeah, they still use money, and that's all the problem. But work time isn't that different. There's also like the standard of a value that's used to compare all the different products. And this is used for to say what efficiency is in there. And the real socialists, they wanted to use work time. They just didn't have the data capacities that we have now to do it. This is kind of a feeble argument, I guess. It's kind of an easy argument. And it's similar with exchange value. It's still in the exchange value work time. Um, they also want a consumer goods market with weak competition and semi-flexible prices so that the people can decide if they want to bread from this cooperative or from this cooperative or whatever. Um, so there's some competition, but this competition again, as always, they, they, they don't go for real efficiency and like hard um, competition, but like a, a little bit of competition and some. So, if the company that produces like the bread that nobody wanted, they will receive less means of production in the next time, but like no, no hard budget constraints. So it's, there are some hard incentives, but still economically soft. So they also import some of the market ideas into their structure. This is a very similar thing that you found within um, the real socialist states themselves. For example, in, in the, the Democratic Republic of Germany, 
there's this funeral of communism. In the 50s, there was a lot about equal pay for everybody in education and the socialist work ethic. And then they um, realized, oh, they were, <laughs> the people don't just work more. And it's basically an idealistic communism that first forced the, um, workers to work and then they were surprised that they don't want to work more. Um, and then what they started with in the 60s and onwards was material interest and performance wages. And um, the Marxist that can healthy argue in capitalism wage differentials are handy tools to lower the price of labor. The call for performance pay has been raised from the standpoint of the dissatisfied wage payer and beneficiary of labor. Its reason and content is the desire of the universal employer, the state, to make its command over labor more effective for greater wage differentiation. So that can help argues that finally the um, the social, the real socialist state, he comes to term that he is <laughs> a capitalist and acts as a capitalist by using the wage differential to um, strengthen his command over the workers. And now we come back to the summary slide and we can say that this uh, command socialism would still be a class society with state capitalists and workers. It would still be a patriarchal society where care labor to huge and is privatized. It still would be an unequal society where the work performance and what work you do is very important to what you get within the society. It's still undemocratic because not really the people decide, but still the exchange value is very at the heart of the incentive structure and creates all these contradictions and contradictions and contradictions that really make rational planning not possible in the end. And in the end, it's also an unfree society where people are forced to do something, where they're exploited, where this alienation at work is still there. So we argue we have to move over to this communist base and leave behind command socialism and market economy. There are further problems. On the one hand, the dictatorship may be very likely because of the authoritarian economic structure. If you think about real socialism, there's like this the state telling all the companies what they have to do, how to distribute it, how to produce, whatever. So it's a very hierarchical structure. Um, and this hierarchical structure, um, it makes very easy for this actor at the top to build, to start with authoritarian means and start a dictatorship. It's not by coincidence that all research list states were dictatorships because this economic structure kind of um, makes it very easy Whereas in the market society, you have on the one hand the power of the, um, the companies, the capitalists and all this kind of stuff of money and the power of the state. And there are a lot of time interlinked by lobbyism and all that kind of stuff, but they're still um, um, separated. Whereas within real socialism, they are kind of bound together. Um, you still have class and patriarchy that we talked about. Um, you still, the workers are basically still work worse in consumption, um, have a socialization of consumption, so they are still paid for by consumption, and that's difficult for ecological society where um, people think about degrowth being an important part. If all your workers want to consume as much as they can, that's different, difficult if you want to an ecological society where it's also not that much only about more material goods. Therefore, we would argue for the highest stage, as Marx called it, he said like the lowest stage is still according to work, um, the higher stage is according to need. Um, and communism, where it's about use the value and about concrete labor, the individual goal, why do people work there, would be the same as the societal goals. There's a coherent incentive structure. People would work because they want to produce, we would use values, because the things that they need, they get it independently of what they do. One still could um, think of credits as budget constraints, that um, there's some kind of communist um, credits that are used to uh, the distribution for products. Um, I think at some places this may be possible. Okay, we could discuss about this. Um, this idea of the realm of freedom of something where you just do what is not important to anybody is a very abstract negation of um, the, the exploitation of work. It's very liberal, atomized in a patriarchal vision of freedom because care labor will always exist. We can't automate 
all of it. Um, so being getting rid of all the labor, all the necessary labor is a very patriarchal idea. Um, and why don't think of freedom in organizing our necessities? Thanks for listening and I'll have fun with the other videos that are around here. <laughs> See ya.